Hi, hello, and welcome to Doha Debates. It is a brand new year, a brand new decade, and we have a brand new set for the pre and post shows. More on that in a minute. But we are all here to ask and answer one very, very important question. The topic of debate for this evening is gender equality. Are quotas the answer? Gender equality, are gender quotas the answer? Our three speakers, our wonderful moderator, Rida Fakhri, and our connector, Dr. Govinda Clayton, are all getting ready, as I speak to you, to get onto that debate stage and have it all out, see what's going on. But this is supposed to be a global debate and a global conversation, and I can't do that without you. And there are more ways than ever to get in touch with us. You can reach me with your comments, thoughts, suggestions, questions on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We are at Doha Debates. If you use the hashtag Dear World, I can far more readily find your answers and include you into the discussion. Just because they're in the studio doesn't mean that you can't be, and it's my job to do that. So make sure you get involved. Now, before we go on and talk about anything else, I want to come over here and speak to a very special guest that will be on the post show. Professor Zalqa, thank you so much for joining me. Thank I you. wanted to get you here because I have a question for you. You uh, specialize in social sciences and humanities at the HBK University right here in Qatar. Right. Thank you for joining us. I want to know, what are you hoping to see in the debate? What are you looking forward to, the, the speakers and the, the moderators getting really stuck in there? Right, thank you. So I'm hoping to hear, first of all, a little bit about uh, what does gender equality mean to our speakers. I'm hoping they would contextualize it a little bit and tell us what would equal opportunity, for example, means in the Middle East or in mm -hmm. Africa. So actually, we want to understand even what the definition of gender equality right. and, and, and quotas are. Right, and so I also want them to, I'm hoping they would talk about quotas and, um, and across different fields, right? What does, uh, for example, gender quota mean in, in academia? Right, and so um, we, I wanted them. I want them to talk about women in politics. I want them to talk about women in business, and I want them to contextualize, and I hope problematize, um, and I hope they would talk a little bit about intersectionality of all these. Those, uh, are, those are a lot of very important big right. words that I'm going to be talking to you about in the post show. Hopefully, thank you, Professor, thank you. for talking to us now. We sent a camera person out onto the streets of Reykjavik, Kigali, and Mexico City, in fact, to ask them a question around this topic. We wanted to know, what are some obstacles to gender equality? This is what they had to say. I don't think there are fundamental differences between men and women that make them better for tasks. I think there are absolutely societal differences that end up forcing that upon others. Well, I think that every person and every individual has certain qualities and certain strengths about them that make them make them better suited for certain job whether they're female male or whatever in between um, people are good at certain things and that makes them better suited for certain jobs no i don't think so we both are same uh, everyone can do anything just the willpower really really interesting comments uh so much more to come your way but i'm being told that we think the debate is nearly set, the stage is set, the, the guests are ready, and we are about to go to them. But before we do, I just want to tell you about one more way that you can get in touch with us, brand new for 2020. You can send us videos of yourself right to our Instagram account. It's very, very easy. You log on to Instagram, you click on that little paper airplane, you search for Doha Debates, you record and tell me what you think. You can say whatever you like. Make sure you mention your name and where you're from and tell me what you think. As soon as you do that, send it right off and I will feature as many of them in the post show as I can. Right, without further ado, let's begin our debate. Dear world, we need to talk. Welcome to Qatar and welcome to Doha Debates where we are searching for solutions to global challenges. The fight for equality, dignity, and respect continues. What should be done about the gender pay gap? The claim that the wage gap between men and women is only due to sex is wrong. First we wanted men to do something for us, but like that time is gone now. It is important for me that little girls and little boys see someone that looks like them included in different things in this world. 
The cry for gender equality has never been louder. Across the world, millions of women are pushing ahead. It is a global scream for equality. And yet, here we are today. Studies show that it will take us at least a century to close the gender gap. So the question we're asking today is, do we simply wait or do we act now to accelerate change? That is our debate here in Doha. Please welcome your Doha Debates moderator, Hida Fakhri. Hello and a very warm welcome to Doha Debates. Today we take on gender equality. Do we need affirmative action? Are quotas the answer? Those in favor of quotas say it is the only way forward. In fact, it's the only way to fix gender discrimination, and give women their rightful place in society. Now, those against say that quotas are ineffective and they can also be counterproductive. Others believe underlying culture must change if we are to empower girls and women. So, as always, three perspectives, and then, of course, we'll be working to find some consensus. We are live from Northwestern University here in Qatar. Today, we're doing the debate without the studio audience as a precautionary measure against the coronavirus. The students who would have joined us here will still be following this debate online and participating. We will, of course, be including as many of their voices and yours as we can. We are, as always, live streaming on Facebook, on Twitter and YouTube. So wherever you are, join this conversation and let's make this a truly global discussion. Our correspondent, Nel Ufar Hedayat, is standing by to tell us how you can all join us. Nel. Thank you very much. Yes, we are on Twitter, on Facebook and on Instagram and I will be looking out to hear from you. We want to know what you think about what's happening on that debate stage. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Is there a question that you would like us to include? This is supposed to be a global debate, as you said, and we would like to make it just so. So, you can get in touch with us on Twitter and on Facebook. You can use that hashtag, Dear World. We are at Doha Debates. And for the very first time, we are actually going to be keeping an eye on Instagram because we have a brand new way for you to get in touch with us. It's actually very easy and you can DM us your videos. Uh, you just follow these very, very simple steps. So, first of all, I want you to open up the Instagram app. I want you to click on the direct messages tab then go straight in there and search for Doha Debates. Once you have found us, you click on that little blue uh, button with the camera and record yourself. Tell me your name, where you're from, and what you feel compelled to say. Get involved. That is the point of the whole thing. And of course, after this main show uh, with you, Rida, I will be here in the post show right here in our brand new set to feature as many of those comments, as those Instagram stories as I can. Rida, back to you. Thanks so much, Nell. Of course, we'll be looking forward to that and we'll be looking forward to the start of this debate. Uh, lots of different ways that you can connect with us and obviously a lot at stake for so many of us. So will we see gender equality anytime soon? Will it be in our lifetime? So, how far away are we from gender equality? Recent studies show that we're over a century away from reaching this goal. The thing is, there's substantial proof that when gender equality increases, everyone is better off. When equality between genders goes up, so does overall life satisfaction for men, women and children. Businesses perform better and GDP goes up and societies are more peaceful. So, why are we so far from reaching this goal? All over the globe, men make more than women for the same jobs. Even in the US, where laws such as the Equal Pay Act of 1963 exist, women earn less than men at every stage of their career, regardless of their level of education. In India, statistics show that there are 63 million fewer women than there should be due to female infanticide, selective abortions, and boys being better fed and cared for. When it comes to schooling, globally, girls are far more likely to be pulled out of school earlier than boys. Around the world, 132 million girls are out of school. When they are in school, they're often harassed, 
marginalized and discouraged from certain fields. And when it's time to get a job, more obstacles slow women down. Women in most countries expect less pay from their first job than men. This widens wage gaps from the get-go, and as women get older, it only gets worse. So, are we surprised that their health, their happiness, their ability to contribute economically, they're all seriously hindered? We know that instituting better laws are a good first step. But surprise, we also don't have nearly enough women in power. Anywhere, political power is an arena where men have the most advantage over women. The truth is, equality is a pretty simple concept, but achieving it, that's really complicated. It's a tall order, but an urgent one, unless we want to wait a hundred years or more for a better, more equal world. A better, more equal world, a tall order, much work to be done, some progress obviously having been made in the last few years, last few decades. We have with us today three speakers, each with their own ideas of how to make this world more equal based on their different cultural and generational experiences. So let's meet them. Randa Abdel Fattah, Aisha Akambi, and Christina Hoff Summers. We also have with us, as always, our connector. Dr. Govinda Clayton is a senior researcher in peace processes within the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. Dr. Clayton's research interests include negotiation, mediation, conflict management, and civil war. As our connector, Dr. Clayton will provide guidance on identifying common ground and steering towards bridge building and consensus. We'll be getting some advice from our connector a little later, but first, let's hear from our speakers. Our first speaker, Randa Abdel Fattah, is an Australian writer of 11 novels, a lawyer, and human rights advocate. She has a PhD in sociology, and her academic work centers on Islamophobia, racism, and everyday multiculturalism in Australia. I come from Australia, where 94.4% of our elected members of parliament and almost 95% of senior executive leaders are of Anglo-European white background. I therefore approach this debate on gender quotas unapologetically upfront about the need to disrupt not only gender hierarchies, but equally racial hierarchies, centering race in my analysis. To advocate for gender quotas in business and academia is not about introducing a policy of affirmative action. It's about shifting an already existing policy of affirmative action from men to women. Affirmative action already is already in operation by default, a historically inbuilt mechanism in our corporate and academic institutions which has produced the reality that men overwhelmingly dominate boardrooms and senior leadership positions in business and academia, giving them the greatest access to the arenas of social, economic and political power. But consider this, just 2.8% of Fortune 500 directors are women of colour. Of the approximately 19,000 professors in the UK, 4,000 are white women and 25 are black British professors. Gender inequality clearly impacts on women, but some more than others. I'm interested in pushing the debate on gender quotas so that it takes into account the nexus between gender and race, recognising that women of colour are both women and people of colour and therefore face sexism and racism. The gender quality debate for too long, particularly in Western countries, has approached women as a group defined by a single axis of oppression. Woman becomes a master category, half of humankind, ignoring the fact that race continues to have social and material relevance for that half. White women enjoy racial privilege as they fight sexism in a male-dominated society. But most importantly, such racial privilege can collude with sexism to further marginalise and discriminate against women of colour. 
we need gender quotas to pursue a radical redistribution of this power dynamic. But I'm not interested in gender quotas that produce boardrooms or an academy of equal parts white men and women. That's not empowerment or equality, that's feminism entrenching racial domination. And let me also be clear that I'm not arguing for gender quotas that give women equal right to secure unequal wealth and exploitative profits. I'm arguing for gender quotas that give women the opportunity, including women of colour, to transform and revitalise knowledge production and teaching in academia. And given big business impacts on all our lives on a daily basis, make a difference in society's key sites of power. Thank you. Our second speaker, Aisha Akanbi, is a writer, cultural commentator, fashion stylist and photographer based in London. She speaks on socio-political issues surrounding race, class, identity and gender. If we don't like gender quotas, as many of us do not, then we have to be active in building a world where they are unnecessary. The situation to me calls for a holistic response and not only a political reaction which involves recognising the different factors that contribute to gender inequality, without suggesting that any explanation beyond misogyny is a betrayal of all women. What might be a betrayal of all women is to, just, is to suggest that there is only one solution to a social problem. In the age of gender strife and ideological mayhem, quotas are a no-brainer, a well-intentioned means of overcoming vocational and political inequality. But quotas may cause tension between colleagues. Any work we care about can make us overly self-critical. Who needs the added anxiety of thinking that your colleagues believe you're only a tick on, uh, tick on a diversity checklist? So many feel tokenized, like they have to carry the weight of being a spokesperson for their entire group, rather than expressing their individual viewpoints. We use the word gender equality to mean women's elevation. And by all means, I am supportive of anything which allows not only women, but anyone to recognize their potential. But if equality isn't only to be a corporate buzzword, then it must go in both directions, unless we are saying that there is no value in, in traditionally female-dominated work, which is to undermine and, un and unknowingly demean jobs that women do. Equality, at its core, suggests that we implement it across the board not only at the top positions. Otherwise, we care more about power than we do equality. It means there's a value in women going into male-dominated industries, like road repairing and plumbing and waste collection, and that there is a benefit of more men entering spaces that are overrepresented by women. The presumption of diversity is that women, or whichever identity group you belong to, come preloaded with a set of ideas that will reinforce the key concerns of their wider group. But this is a fundamental mistake, because the difference between individuals is much larger than that of the group. As such, it will be a benefit to regard individuals as individuals, not only as spokespeople for their particular groups. It is the, tradition, it is the traditional and stereotypical ideas and judgments of our identities that we are now trying to overcome. So if we have to refocus on identity to reorganize business and politics, we must remember that liberation and equality for some is the chance to not be seen for what they are, but for who they are. Our third speaker, Christina Hoff Summers, is an author and a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. She co-hosts the podcast, The Femsplainers, and hosts YouTube's The Factual Feminist. I am a strong believer in gender equality, but quotas are not the answer. First of all, they send the message that women, we just can't make it on our own. But you know what happens? All women then, including many who could make it on their own, they're forced to bear the stigma of preferential treatment. Second reason I oppose gender quotas is there's no evidence that they work. Now, consider what happened in Europe. In many countries, they have gender quotas for members of corporate boards. 
And we've been told that these will improve corporate decision-making, boost performance, help advance women at lower levels. But none of this has been borne out. And in 2018, The Economist reviewed 10 years of data to see if any of this happened. And it concluded that gender quotas have done very little to boost corporate performance or to help women in other parts of the corporation. Now, in less prosperous, non-democratic societies, quotas are doing actual harm. Take, for example, gender quotas for political office. What happens is that women, talented, educated women, are pulled out of the mainstream society, where they are desperately needed, into the government where they serve. Now, if the government is an autocracy, they serve as long as they make no waves. They have to be silent. Now, women's activists in countries in Rwanda, Nicaragua, they have warned that this veneer of equality is actually working against women. There are no fixed solutions where gender ju justice is concerned. There are no quick fixes. The key to women's equality is free expression, where reformers, visionaries can change hearts and minds by making their case through discourse. You also have to have laws uh, that treat women as equals. You have to take down barriers. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that in everything we do, we have to treat people not as tokens of a type, but as individuals. Now, under conditions of equal opportunity, we know that men and women flourish, and they're able to pursue happiness as they define it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Christina. Thank you to you, Aisha, and thank you, Randa, as well. So now we've heard all three different perspectives, three very different takes on what we should do. Let me quickly recap each position. Randa began by saying that we need quotas, but we also need to disrupt gender and racial hierarchies, that quotas are needed for women, but some women more than others. She says that it is the racial minority and ethnic minority women who need that sort of affirmative action, which she says needs to be shifted from men to women. Aisha was saying that we need a more holistic approach, that yes, quotas can work sometimes, but this gender equality debate, if it is to achieve its goals, will need something much bigger, something much more um, conclusive, including a radical reorganization of society and serious rethinking of traditional gender roles within society. Now, Christina, we just heard, is completely opposed to quotas, any form of quota. She said they send the wrong message, they are simply ineffective. In fact, she even says they can be harmful. Uh, a quota system, Christina believes, could only succeed by coercion, and it doesn't take into account our fundamental differences. So, so these are the three different positions. It's time to vote. We need your input to find common ground among the speakers. We want to know exactly how much value you attach to the arguments you've heard. You have a total of 100 points to divide. You can divide them over one, two, or all three statements. To do so, simply assign points to the statements on a sliding scale. So now, while you vote and while you weigh your different options, I'd like to go back to Nelufar to see what trends are emerging online. Nell. Ridder. It might be quiet in the studio, but it's pretty loud on Twitter at the moment. We are getting lots of comments in response directly to a lot of what our uh, speakers have been saying. It's, it's firing up on Twitter, in fact, and I encourage people to continue in the conversation. We've had one person from South Africa, uh, Karabu Mogashwa, say, I wish I could applaud for that first speaker, Randa. So obviously she's resonated quite profoundly with Karabu. And then lots of comments from all over the world. We've got someone with the handle Darsanic1, who's messaged us in from Kathmandu uh, in Nepal. And they say, gender equality is today's demand and it is necessary. It is inevitable. Men and women have to be ready to support each other, which is a really interesting perspective. I've got someone else in Berlin. Sergio says, gender quotas feel like a temporary step. 
That's an interesting one. In the fight to gender equality, they provide a practical measure that can be quantified. However, in the long term, I think the drive for gender equality needs to come from a general societal response. I'm not really sure what that means, but that, that's an interesting one. Maybe you, Rida, can put to our speakers. And very finally, from Sussex, England, uh, A.S. Keeling says, unfortunately, we are trying to change the unreasonable attitude of men which has been around for centuries. One cannot force this upon them. They have to be persuaded to change. As ever, you can get in touch with us on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. We are at Doha Debates. Send in your comments. Tell me what you think of what the speakers are saying. There's now a brand new way that you can get in touch uh, with us for the post show in the analysis. When we, when we kind of break down what everyone is saying online, you can get in touch with us on Instagram as well. Make sure you remember to do that. So you're logging in to the Instagram app which is very easy to do. And then I want you to click on that little button right there into your direct messages. Once you have done that, search for us. We are Doha Debates. Once you have filled those uh, bits and bobs, you can hold your camera up and record your message. What do you want to tell me? What do you need to get off your chest? What do you want to say about what's happening on that debate stage? When you filmed it, send it straight to us and I will try and feature as many of your Instagram messages, your tweets and your comments in the post show. Rida, back to you. Jennifer, thanks very much. I'm told that the results are soon coming in. Not sure that we've... Uh tabulated them all so far. So let me just bring you back in, Nell, while we await for these results. It's another uh, minute or so, I believe. Are, are you sensing any special engagement coming from any particular part of the world? I mean, it's good to know that people are fired up around this topic, which is always going to be somewhat of an explosive, sensitive issue. Are you sensing more engagement from some places as opposed to others? Actually, what's really surprising, Greta, is that this seems to be captivating people from around the world. Now, I'm sure our speakers will get to this in a minute, but I'm finding that most people are trying to find unity amongst both men and women. This seems to be something that we all understand to be a global problem. So whether you're calling in uh, and commenting on Twitter from Brooklyn uh, or Zimbabwe or Rwanda, a lot of the people say the same thing, that they agree progress needs to happen, that it's going to be difficult, but this is not a woman-only problem, a lot of the people say. This seems to be a problem for all of us, and therefore we're going to need everybody, all hands, on deck. I will keep watching Twitter to see uh, what people say. But at the end of the day, it, it does seem to be a, a general consensus that's going to have to be all of us. All right, that's wonderful. Thanks so much, Nelufar. And we'll come back to you, of course, uh, as you get more of the engagement uh, going online. I'm told that we do have these results. So let's see what we have agreed on and what we haven't. Let's put up the results on the wall behind me. So you can see there the second argument, the one that was made by Aisha, is the one that has resonated the most for now, followed by Randa's argument, which went up first, and then Christina's coming in third. So quotas can have some benefits, but we first need to revise cultural expectations. That got about 40 plus percent of the votes. So this is the situation now. Let's see what we can do with this result coming up next. Welcome to the Mejlis, a traditional Arab consensus building practice. The focus of the Mejlis is to welcome critical conversations and reach solutions. Hida will encourage our speakers to bridge differences and find common ground. So let's see if we can bridge those differences. Obviously, some very different ideas on either side of the spectrum. Christina and, I, and uh, Randa, of course, I, Aisha, somewhere in the middle. So we, we listened to you all very intently. Uh, Randa, you seem to say that white women, in fact, you said this, I quote you, white women enjoy racial privilege that can collude with sexism. In this fight for gender equality, then, is Christina an ally, or is she a foe? Um, I think when I, when I mean that, I think that we have to be responsible for the impact of our words and what we fight for, who we, who it ends up who we end up aligning with, who our voice emboldens. And I think that your position, Christina, does not advance the position of underprivileged women who have historically been marginalised and who are not um, 
as the current status quo shows, um, enjoying the freedom to, to participate in society as equals because they are historically marginalised. I'm talking about in particular Western countries where um, women of colour are not the majority and who do need um, who do need support in order to overcome that historical um, underprivileged position in society because the feminist movement in, in Western size in particular sees women and w women as a universal experience and often is speaking about white women's p uh, positions and doesn't take into account um, the position of women of colour. And so I think that that needs to be overcome. Christina, you're leaving out people like Randa. They're not part of your fight, are they? What do you say to that? Oh, uh, Brenda's part of my fight and um, er everyone's part of my fight. And what I like that some of the, the, the viewers said was that it's something men and women must do together. I agree with that. Mm. But I also think that we, in our pursuit of intersectional justice, men are have their intersectional, you, you know, they suffer in ways, they are, uh, there are hierarchies where they are the have-nots. And I worry about a women's movement that is leaving men behind. Because what they do is they tend to concentrate on men that are at the pinnacle of success, or in your case, a few women, but most people aren't at these heights of great glory and you know, CEOs of Fortune 500s. You have to look at men and women th across the culture, across the society. How are they doing? Boys are behind in education. Where, where is the call for quotas to, to help them advance to college? Our colleges are increasingly female dominant. We have our prisons full in the United States, it's basically incarceration of men. It's a race issue and a gender issue. And I just don't see a movement that brings that into the calculus. So I think I, I if think men are in trouble, so are we all. If women are in trouble, so are we all. We are in this together. I find that a very problematic um, response because for example, in Australia, when you look at the Australian um, uh, Men's Alliance Movement, um, Men's Health Alliance, um, and, it, and it, you know, tracks the problems that men are facing in society, um, problems most often caused by patriarchy, which is what we are all struggling against, because it harms women and it harms men. Um, in the list of things that it addresses with, you know, uh, higher suicide rates, with more dying, you know, in more workplace deaths, so the kind of things that you speak about often, not once in the um, responses and solutions to that is it that women are focusing on you know, women's gender equality issues. The solutions are fight patriarchy, focus on men's health, focus on um, better working conditions. Is this conditions. every woman's fight though? Because you say this is what all women are fighting against, but I wonder if Aisha, mm -hmm. you agree that this is your fight too. Is it an us versus them, an us women versus the oppressors, the evil men, mm -hmm. the oppressive patriarchal system? Do you see it? Do you see the enemy the way Randa does? Um, no, but I understand the position and I think it's, um, I think it's uh, an understandable one. Um, but no, that's not the way I see it. I think if we're ever going to build together, I don't think we can afford to see men as the opposition. I think we need to remind people how these sort of structures that are unequal, not just only in top levels, but across the spectrum, have a harm for us all. And so I think we are all manipulated and forced to act in ways sometimes that are counterproductive to the, the means that we wish to achieve. And so I don't think um, seeing anybody for, I don't know, their race or their gender or their sexuality or anything like that, I don't see, I don't see seeing any of those things as an issue is going to be helpful going well, forward. I don't think, I have never said that men are the enemy or the mm. opposition. And this is the beauty of arguing about justice in terms of structures, in terms of systems. It means we're not talking about immoral men or evil men or oppressive men. It actually lets individuals off the hook and makes us focus on historical processes that have created structures of privilege that have allowed this status quo to evolve in which men have, and the numbers bear this out, are in greater numbers in institutions. And so that way we can work together as men and women but, to but take you on want a structure. To work together with of men. course fact, I do. you want to work together with other women because you seem to be creating a lot of subdivisions, subgroups, Oops, no. layers. 
Does the that layers help are you? very important well, because does that helps help? us it weaken the base. No, of course base. it's very important because it means that we are identifying the nuances in this argument. That it's never going to be a one-size-fits-all approach. Gender quotas are not a key or a solution. They are part of a, like you said, a holistic transformational project in which men and women come on board to change a structure that has been historically in place, and we need to work together to take that on. Will you work together with all feminists? I know you describe yourself, Christina, as an equity feminist. Yes. Suppose you would say that Randa is a gender feminist. You wrote a book a while ago uh, with the title, Who Stole Feminism? Mm -hmm. How Women Have Betrayed Women. Were you, were you talking about the Randas of this world? I like Rhonda very much, but I disagree with her on this. I do think she's what I would call a gender feminist. And by that, I, I mean an equity feminist is someone who wants for women what they want for everyone. Dignity, equality, liberty. And in my view, throughout many parts of the world, not all, but in many parts of the world, certainly in my country, it's been a, a magnificent success story. Women are, have achieved parity with men in so many domains and even moved beyond them. There are still say problems. Black women say this to Hispanic it, women. It, it, you know, with, with African American and Latino women, if you look at what is happening in education right now, they are on a trajectory that sociologists are at a loss to explain. But the sad thing is, is their brothers are not going along with them. So I'm trying to point out these complexities. I don't think it helps anymore in most parts of the world. I don't think it helps to talk about and to, to deploy a narrative where uh, women, men are the oppressors and women are oppressed. Almost everywhere, there, it, men and women, there's a complex set of burdens and benefits. And I think basic fairness, basic humanity, basic empathy, that we have to look at one another as human beings, not as members of a class. And, and sometimes when people talk about patriarchy and the structures and so, I think they're talking about the human condition and we all have to find ways to mitigate suffering where it's, where it's occurring, but to diff I just, I hear d division. But have we not tried this for too long? This approach. I think you're arguing for a recipe of complacency. Not at it all. Feels like very, it feels like mission statements because, of course, we all agree that we need fairness and equality and justice. But you know, we're, we're at a point now where we need action. And how are you going to deliver on that? Well, I, it, as, a, it, as a woman of colour, supposed to just trust that you know society is going to let her in, that society is going to give her those opportunities. At some point. We need action. We need some evidence that it's not just mission statements or feel-good statements. And it's not abstract theories that have no bearing on reality. Of course and, and if you talk about African women, that's not a monolith. There, there are many, many different, you know, different classes of women and, and, and religions and wants. They can't, they're not just a model of a group you can generalize about. So the problem with the intersectional analysis is you keep having to, to subdivide and keep going down and you get more and more groups and more and more people competing for attention. When what I say is to look in the society, where, where is there suffering? And look at fundamental metrics, not abstract theories. Let's, let's ask Aisha. Mm. Aisha, do you feel that you want to speak on behalf of a group? You said that the I want to speak on behalf of on behalf of a group, on behalf of say, no, I'm, uh, black I, women. I couldn't. I think I would be doing. Um, you, said, you said earlier that you feel that uh, differences among individuals yeah. are bigger than differences among. Yeah, I do. I, I don't believe that um, uh, black communities and, and even black community or, is is a tricky word because there isn't essentially. You know, we're not a monolith, and and people feel differently. I know plenty of black people who don't think racism is a big issue. You know, and because I think the conversation that we're having is one that is, to use the word, maybe quite privileged in that sense, because a lot of people are just getting on. And I don't think the, the ways that we frame the world through a sociological lens is how a lot of people are receiving the world. Um, and so, no, I wouldn't speak on behalf of all black women or all black people. I only speak on what I believe feels honest and truthful to my experience. And if people can relate to that, then great. But so I'm let me ask you this mm. then, because you say we're all privileged. Uh, now, we heard Rhonda say that someone like Christina is among the more privileged. Yes, I mean, age are enhanced, among the more privileged. Age you enhanced, feel less privileged than Christina based on the color of your skin. Definitely not. And I know that it's at the moment um, 
quite a popular thing to, to believe that I am, but I can't afford to feel that way. I can't afford to feel as though Christina is more privileged than me because that will color my, self, my sense of esteem. And that's not something, that's not a privilege I can give to anybody. And, and, and it would be so presumptuous of me in, in, without knowing a lot more about her to assume I'm more privileged. I think it's, it's patronizing or matronizing to you. I see, it, I see it as that way. I see it and I, and I get it and I understand because essentially by the word privilege we're trying to say that, you know, Christina isn't going to face racism, you know, and she may not face racism in America in the way that I potentially could, but she could face racial discrimination in other parts of the world, um, depending on where she was located. So, no, I don't like to assume that every white woman, white person is more privileged than me, because I think actually teaching this to people is, is self-defeating, and I think it's disempowering. Uh, I think there are ways to speak about racism that don't, that don't sort of privilege white people as having something inherently just better than everyone, not maybe better, but I don't know, more, more beneficial than everybody else. That's not my experience. So, Randa, what do you say to this? That there may be a certain cultural aspect to this discussion, but what really drives inequality may not be gender or race, but perhaps socioeconomic conditions. Well, that's the whole point of intersectionality. And this debate is so much more than about how I feel about you or whether I feel you're privileged than me. I mean, that's for me, that's a completely irrelevant question. We're talking about systems and structures here and the way that societies are organised. And, of course, that's the, that's the beauty of looking at the world in terms of intersectionality, as Kimberly Crenshaw said. It's a tool. It's an analytical tool. Because the reality is, and maybe this doesn't apply to, to you as individuals, but the reality is that we all occupy different intersections in society. And for some people, the intersection of class and gender is going to affect their life chances. For others, it's going to be the intersection of, of race and class. It's going to be the intersection of sexuality and, and race. So it's important for us to understand this rather than just to flatten everybody as, having, as individuals having equal life chances. Because the reality is that identities are politicised. None of us bear any sort of depoliticized identity. The fact is that we are all the bearers of some kind of identity that is imposed on us. Me, a Muslim, Australian, Egyptian woman in Australia, I would love to be treated as an individual, but I'm sorry, I'm in a settler colonial multicultural society, and there are certain areas and certain contexts in which my Muslimness, my Palestinianness, my Egyptianness, my particular class, these are going to be the things that are going to be used against me, weaponized against me. That's not me trying to whinge about identity or play identity politics. It's the reality of the way societies are structured to weaponize people's identities against them. And so that's what I but, think but we using, need to do. But using uh, racism, I mean, aren't you then uh, allowing this to be more important perhaps than it should be, that maybe this is more about class driving inequalities than it is about racism? I mean, Christina alluded to the fact that, you know, even among men, there are lots of inequalities. Among women, there are lots no, of inequalities because I, I started by saying I come from a country where 94.4% of our elected members of parliament are of Anglo background. That's not me saying it's about race. It's the statistics. I come in a country, a multicultural country, where 25% of us were born overseas, but the majority, the vast majority of our parliament are white. I mean, what does that say? Race can, matters. Can we ignore the implicit racism? Well, uh, the thing is, I have seen fairly good studies of uh, racism around the world. And uh, the, the, the Washington Post recently had a map. It was a, an analysis of uh, various questions they asked people. And Australia and the United States were among the least racist countries oh in Canada. Ask and compare people that. I mean, that's, that's actually grossly offensive. Um, you well, know, we, it, the, it, the, you, that may be what your opinion is, but I'm telling my you experience. that... It's my experience. The person who killed the Muslims worshipping in Christchurch this month, last year, was an Australian. I, don't Please don't talk to me about well, race in Australia. But then, then I would imagine people. the reaction of the majority of citizens was horror. Because, we, of course, we have these things happen in the United States, and the majority of people are horrified, and, and we'll do, it, it, and there's an outpouring of love, and we'd have to look at that. And, that. and that's that fellow feeling. And I think that we're not there yet, and I don't think you're there yet in Australia, but wow, where else in the world are people making such an effort to be inclusive? And we have 
very high levels now of, of intermarriage uh, among races. I mean, you, the, the problem, you're not, we're not going to be able to keep the, this whole thing in, in, structured because there's, people are falling in love. The but we're talking about the effect, the concrete effect on outcomes. On the outcome is that we're not... Oh, if, if, if we can't equalize the, the starting position, mm. and it seems to be a bit of a utopian concept, why don't we equalize the finish line, the quotas that Randa's talking about? What's so wrong with that, Christina? Because they don't work. They, what, either, and I think we agree on this, that what can happen, I mean, you had a critique of the way they are used, they can just create, you replace an old boy network with an old girl network, and you have a group of elite women who are benefit, but there's no evidence that it trickles down and empowers women at, at lower levels. It's just not there. I guess it depends on the context. I mean, you know, because there's quotas in parliaments, there's quotas in business, there's quotas in academia. So I think it's also important for us to, to pick apart the evidence of where it works and where it could be fine-tuned. Um, uh, th that's really important as well. I mean, that's very important. But take quotas in politics. So uh, it, it, this is a big problem because people will look at uh, Rwanda and say, 60% of the members of parliament are women, and it's held up as a, a, a sort of paragon of gender equity. But the women have no power. Now, in the United but, States, or but Canada, you don't know for this, this for a fact, though. The symbolism, though, is important, isn't it? The symbolism, it's empty, and it actually inhibits reform because the outside world, it will pour in support and, and, not, and, and hold back on criticism. And now you have feminists and human rights workers saying, please stop praising countries that just have this, this chimera, this, this, this veneer of equality. Now, in the United States, we have more men in the Senate and more men. It's getting better, but it's nowhere near parity. But you know what? It doesn't really matter because as a woman, I can vote for somebody who represents my interests. And that's not necessarily, you know, we, we, just, had a, we just had a primary and the, woman didn't, the women didn't win, but a lot of women, very liberal women, voted for Bernie Sanders because he, they felt he represented their interests. That's not, that's not oppression, that's f freedom. Freedom so that's choice. politics, where a lot of women have the aspirations to join governments. We've seen that in the United States, six competent women couldn't get very far yet again. But taking other professions in the world, Aisha, mm. talking about the freedom that, uh, that uh, you spoke about earlier, uh, do you feel that uh, we must acknowledge the fact, too, that we have different interests, that women don't necessarily want to be fighter jet pilots, they don't want to serve in the army, they don't want to fix rooftops, that we may have different interests, different aspirations, and that quotas could end up making us feel somewhat, somewhat coerced to fit an ideal. Do you buy into that argument? Well, I think it's... I don't think it should be dismissed completely, and I think that could be, you know. It, it's argued and widely stated that that's maybe a, a product of socialisation, and maybe there might be some things that we need to do to... To, to counter that, but I, I do think that different interests, because of our, what we think about what's desirable for men, what we think about what's desirable for women, are still quite rigid in many ways. And I think this does, um, this does push us in different direction. Also, cultural expectations. I know growing up, uh, you know, with a Nigerian family, there were certain jobs that this is what you're going to do and this is what you don't do, you know? And, and I think that existed in many different cultures in different ways. And so I think there can be maybe cultural um, inclinations that push us in different directions as well as gendered um, expectations. Um, and I don't think they are worth dismissing, which isn't to say that sexism isn't an issue, um, but I don't know if it's the whole issue. Are women sometimes their own worst enemies in that some women, the older generation certainly, in some of the more conservative societies, Muslim countries and others, hold themselves back because of wanting to, to do what their, their grandmothers did, mm. wanting to do the jobs that were seen as women, women's jobs. Uh, so what, what do, do you feel that women sometimes hold their own progress back in certain societies that are more conservative? Um, not necessarily in, in conservative societies, because I think it's always a bit more complex than that. Um, but again, I think that, you know, the, there's always going to be people who are going to make decisions that, from an outsider's perspective, seems uh, not to be a free choice. Or, and I think it's important to recognise people's agency as well. Um, 
But at the end of the day, what we're, what we're trying to address here is that there is a, a status quo. I mean, the status quo is that we do not have gender equality. And gender quotas, we're arguing, are they one solution to this? They're not, they're not the perfect solution. They're not going to fix the problem. But isn't it about time that we do something? That but we but try do you want to equalise every profession? No, it's impossible to equalise every profession. And there is no one-size-fits-all approach. There's going to be certain, for example, in academia, you know, it's fine-tuned ba based on the discipline. Um, you're never going to get 50-50 parity, say, in engineering. So uh, I think that these are usually scare tactic arguments to say, well, men and women are, diff um, are different, so how can you achieve 50-50 parity? Let's just throw the baby out with the bathwater. We are more intelligent and nuanced. We're capable of um, creating very complex ways to uh, keep people out of countries, very complex racially based immigration systems, but when it comes to fine tuning some gender quotas to increase women's participation in certain industries and in certain sectors of society, suddenly the people fall into hysterical, you know, um, that we can't do it or it's too hard. It's not too hard. Um, there is a problem. The status quo is unsatisfactory. More women want to, more women and men, because it affects men as well. They have daughters, don't they? They're <laughs> the wives. This discrimination affects us all, and I think that gender quotas are one answer. You mentioned men, and I know a man who's standing by, waiting to come in and give us his thoughts on how we can actually sort out our differences. Govinda Clayton, our connector, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Gita. Ladies, hello. Well, as you may have noticed, I am a man, <laughs> which means I'm at serious risk of mansplaining right now. <laughs> so, just to be very clear on my role here. I'm an expert in conflict resolution, and so I've been standing in the wings listening to this discussion, and what I'd like to do now is maybe guide or encourage or perhaps even challenge you to look for the potential common ground or consensus points, because you're all clearly experts in this topic and come at it from very different perspectives, but I think for, for myself as a non-expert and for everybody watching at home, it'd be great to see if even though you have very different positions, there are some areas in which we might find some agreement. So, from the way that I've heard the discussion so far, one kind of point of consensus across you all is the fact that nobody here is saying that the quotas are in them of themselves like a golden bullet or a panacea that's going to resolve the deep-rooted structural inequalities we have in our society. And I think everybody in their own way has spoke about um, the need for, a, let's say, a holistic solution that deals with the various different groups and types of inequalities that we emerge, that we observe. But I, I think we can maybe try and go a little bit further than that. So rather than have this kind of abstract level of agreement, if we can find some specific areas of commonalities. So in conflict resolution practice, which is, is kind of my domain, what we do when we have contentious issues like this is, is a couple of things. First of all, we try and focus on very specific issues. So rather than trying to reach agreement on everything, we kind of zero in on, on the specifics. And secondly, we try and broaden the focus from binary terms. So when thinking about quotas, not thinking about whether quotas as a whole are all good or, or all bad, we do very much what Randy was actually just suggesting is we try and pull them apart and think about well, in what type of context or what types of quotas might be effective in different types of ways. So my kind of invitation to you all as we move into the next session of the discussion is can you identify between you one particular area or a number of areas or different types of quotas in which you might find some agreement? Or if that is not possible, thinking about the function that quotas are attempting to achieve and see are there other types of tools and approaches, whether legal or political, through which we might achieve the same function that, that we're attempting to achieve through quotas. I think that type of consensus or common ground would be really useful for me and maybe everybody at home. Thanks so much, Govinda. These are interesting thoughts that I will explore with our guests. And I, let me go to you first, Aisha, someone who is willing to listen to the other side and maybe entertain some of the ideas that are put forward. Mm. What do you make of this notion of perhaps, uh, you know, taking what is workable from either side? Mm. Uh, that quotas, in some cases, maybe you have an idea of where they work best. Maybe they can be applied or maybe not. I'm. I'm not sure, I think on a political level, although I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that, every, you know, we, I think we've seen examples in the world where women in political power don't have, you know, women's interests. You know, in fact, they can be really polarizing figures that most people do not like. Um, so, although I don't believe that all women will necessarily have their interests, I think in areas like politics, for the symbolism, um, because I do think symbolism has some weight, you know, in allowing people to know what's possible. Because I do think humans do have this nature where we see people doing something and we want to do it, you know? So I think it's 
beneficial in that space. Um, but I don't know, there's lots of areas where there is um, gender imbalance, and I think it's worth thinking about some of the reasons as to why that exists that aren't necessarily to do with um, discrimination. I, I don't know if it's always that case. I think it's a very, I don't know, I think it's an easy way to look at the world, I do, you know? Um, and I, I have looked at the world in that way a lot in the past. And the more I speak to people, it's just not what I, I see so much. Um, and so I just think that we need to, to think about other areas beyond discrimination, why these imbalances exist. Christina, are you I willing to detain helpful. the quotas in any specific it's, it's, instances? We, I don't think that all discrepancies in society are owed to discrimination. There are other possibilities, so I agree with you there. Mm -hmm. I also think that I, I do, and I think we share this, we do want a diverse society. We mm -hmm. want diverse you know, uh, political bodies. But there are other ways to get there than quotas. I find quotas just a, a gimmick and rigged and they, they, they create more problems than they're worth, but I'm open to being persuaded that in some contexts they could work, but I'm just, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen enough evidence. But there are other things to do. You can, you, you can have um, a, in, an atmosphere where you're encouraging uh, companies, and, and I, uh, for example, to have more women on boards or create an environment where people are welcoming to women and I've seen it work. It's working in the United States. And there have been excellent studies that show when women run for office, they are just as likely to win as men, and they, they uh, raise as much money. It's just that fewer women choose to run. So that tells me, okay, why? Let's, and, and one reason is that they didn't think of it. And fewer women that, you know, were class president and so forth. So there are organizations in the United States that are, it, actually uh, kind of development programs to help guide young women to political careers. And this seems to me to be an answer, and it's not coercive, and it's not attacking anybody. It's just, I, I think, programs that kind of grow organically out of the, the, the culture work better, and in the long run, make us happier. R Rhonda, some women obviously feel that quotas don't work, they can be demeaning. In fact, they say they don't empower women because they don't create that environment. What do you say to them? No, I, I would disagree. I mean, obviously there are going to be sort of um, at the beginning of a quota system, there will be perceptions that somebody has been appointed because of a quota, so they become the quota person, the quota woman. Um, it's tokenistic. But I, I think we should shift the onus. And sh what, what this does by constantly focusing on women as the underprivileged and needing the quota is we forget actually the bigger picture here, which is that men are evading these sorts of levels of scrutiny. So rather than ask, why do you deserve this? Why are you not? Why, why do you deserve this because you're not a quota woman? You know, what, what is your level of competence? Well, what have the majority of men in a boardroom or in academia done to deserve being the majority? Why can't we shift the onus back on why there is an over-representation rather than an under-representation? I just think it's very problematic to constantly think about it being something that's going to lead to tokenism because... Again, I feel it's a straw man argument. But again, isn't it all because the of injustice, though? And again, isn't it problematic as well for women to feel that they can't earn their way forward? That quotas, in some ways, can perpetuate this notion of women being victimized, being victims. No, I think I think that this is a quota system is a, a complete rebuttal to the idea of victimhood. It's actually about saying, you know what, we need to take action. We need to take action because this isn't about victimhood. It's not about morality or evil, the evil men versus, you know, good women. The point is that there is an, a, a, an imbalance and it needs to be redressed. And the quota system is one way to do that. And if you have a critical mass of women, I mean, if you have a quota system where you bring on board one woman, yeah, sure, she's going to be the quota woman. So let's be smart about the way we design it. And, you know, all but the again, is it because sure. of the social choices that women make too, because of nature, because women stop working at a certain stage in their career sometimes to have children, to have a family. Is it about injustice, Aisha, the way you see it? You mentioned that much... Uh, with, uh, by, by way of uh, tokenism has to do with, you know, putting on quotas in many of these different institutions. But more than that, do you feel that quotas actually also go against the grain of democracy in some way? Um, well, 
I guess it's, it's, it's easy to say that, but then, you know, as Rhonda is saying, there is an imbalance, and, and I think that's undemocratic. Um, and so we do need to find ways that we can look into those, look into that issue, but I just don't know if, yeah, well, I think what um, me and Rhonda can agree on, and maybe, yeah, maybe I'm not sure if Christina's there too, but I think we can recognize that maybe it's a short-term solution. You know, I don't know if you think this is maybe something that's meant to be long-term or maybe a permanent solution. God, no, that's, yeah, that's yeah. the point is hopefully we'll never have to be long-term. Exactly, um, and, and that's what I'm saying as well, is just that it, it may be a short-term solution, but I think that there are so many different factors at work here, and yeah, I think, yeah, it shouldn't be something that we rely on. A short-term solution, do you agree, Christina? I just don't think you fight discrimination by discriminating. I don't think it works. And in, in, in the case of, of, of quotas, they, they create resentment because, and, and take it to a particular level. I, I remember interviewing uh, some professors at MIT. It was a department of planetary, I don't know, he was an expert on the, on the, on the atmosphere on Venus, yeah, the climate on Venus. And he wanted to hire some planetary scientists. And they were working on global warming. And they, there was a guy they wanted to get from Colombia. He was the best in the field. And he was told, no, it has to be a woman. You can't, you know, the dean said, and then the dean would come and say, we will give you positions, but you have to hire women. Now, this bothers me because I think it undermines excellence. I think it under, undermines merit. And go to the psychology department, go to veterinary medicine. It's increasingly female dominated and yet nobody's going there and saying you can only hire a man in the school of social work or the school of education they go they, it, it, i see a power grab by elite women uh, and they're using the language of injustice and oppression to it, it, to it, it kind of gain things in a in a very specific situation where it, it shouldn't be happening. And, it, and I don't, again, I'm not seeing the benefits for are, are, women in general. So our quota is inherently une unequal in many respects because they do favor the women who have more education, who have more opportunities. Well, that's the point, isn't it, though? I mean, like, the, when you have a quota system, for example, in academia, the point is not that... Um, the point, is, the, the way that I envisage it is that if you have candidates, you don't just look at the male candidates, and if, if there are, you know, equal, uh, there's a male and a female who have equal credentials, equal excellence, then in that, in that department where there is an imba gender imbalance, then go with a woman. It's, it's an orientation, it's a way of looking at, uh, about the recruitment practice in a way that actually acknowledges that there is a gender imbalance, the, the bigger picture there, I think. But I think, I think that is, he, I, he would have liked to have found a woman, and most people, if they don't have that many women, they I find very positive attitudes, and they want more women. And, but sometimes the best person for the job is not a woman. But, and then to have a, an enforced quota, I do see that in a, in a real life situation where you're hiring. Think if you're starting a company. Do you want the government to be telling you who you can hire? And why should it just, why do we stop at women? Because why don't we be fully intersectional? And I just saw an analysis of, of the publishing industry. And they said, We're, we, we haven't achieved equity yet. We, it's 76% women, but most of them are cisgendered. They're not, you know, they're, they're, they're very few trans women. They're very few, they're all gay women, but not enough. And then they said, and disabled. They wanted... But does that scare you? Does it scare you that it we are actually... It doesn't scare me. It's, it, it's not practical. Well, it's who cares? To, why do we have to... Why can we not recognise... Because we live in a real world where you and have And the real to... world is that people are out there who are not white, who are not heterosexual, who are not privileged and elitist, and they want a fair choice chance as well. And we, it's about time that we recognise that they need a leg up. They need assistance. They well, need you know, support. You say they. Do you think that they all share your politics? And that you're speaking for if they don't want, if, No, of course not. I'm well, not that's assuming. a problem because I, I don't I'm see evidence. I'm talking about people who are... Who no, are it's a, don't it's, I think it's privilege. a left-wing analysis. It has merit, and sometimes I think that way, but other times I just think, you're not really speaking for the majority. I'm speaking the majority. for the bottom uh, half of society, not the top. That's what I'm talking about here. Well, the top are, they aren't That's applying for the, positions in, in physics So department. let's say, for example, a company has... Uh, 
all white women in its top tier positions, mm. Aisha, to you. So no diversity in that, mm. in that case. Does it make that boardroom, does it make that company and its policies necessarily unfair? Um, again, I, I, I really struggle and I'm, I'm open to the fact that maybe I'm being naive here, but when it comes to maybe an intersectional quota of, of that merit, I, do, I mean, of that degree, I don't necessarily think it's threatening, but again, it maybe strikes me as um, impractical, like how do we make sure, where do we find all of these people? Like how do we, how do we assign maybe enough trans people, enough gay women, enough black women to, to certain jobs? Like how do we know that there are as many around who want to even be in those roles? Um, I just, I don't, I just can't, uh, I can't settle on the fact that this is all a case of being purposely left out, at least in my life, and I'm not particularly privileged, I haven't gone to the best schools, and fair enough, I can't use myself for everyone else, but I think we do have a lot more in common than we do apart, and I think, I'm sure people can relate to me, is that I don't feel like I've been let out of many but, but places. So would you feel sufficiently represented, Oh, would I feel, well, the thing is, I don't necessarily feel like a skin color represents me. I feel like values, ethics, ideas, principles, that's what represents me. I can't guarantee that me and another black woman or another lesbian woman or another, I don't know, short woman in the room are going to, yeah, inherently share my beliefs or share my perspective on the world and, and values. I, I can't, R that doesn't you agree. It's not about the gender. It's not about the, the race you represent, not the, the religion, well, I don't think it's not about the, the other subgroups. Uh, I don't think it's just about representation, though. We're talking about, for example, in academia, and, I, and part of my research is to interview students, and I've spent the last three years interviewing high school students and university students about race and their experience of university and schooling systems. And many of the student, students, both Muslim and non-Muslim, because I was doing a comparative study, spoke not just about the importance of representation, but also how having a person of colour as an academic teacher for them made a difference in the way that they experienced their knowledge, um, the, the way they experienced curriculum content, the critical thinking that they were exposed to. So it's not just about whether I see somebody with the same skin colour or wearing a hijab and immediately I'm going to resonate with them. No, it's Again, isn't it tokenism in many respects because mm -hmm. women of a certain group don't necessarily always push the agenda. No, exactly. And I think it's just about adding compl complexity and diversity. Well, I, think, about... I think we do agree that in the, in the merits of diversity. Of course. And if you just see all one type of people, then it, it almost looks wrong now. I mean, you can't, mm -hmm, and, yeah. and I think because we have made progress. And if you have a panel, and oh, it's all women. That wouldn't be appropriate, would it? No, wait a minute. What are we doing? We had, but the we had a mansplainer. We had a mansplainer. <laughs> but, but the reason it wouldn't be all women now is because there is, you know, we need to have some a, a balance there. there. There is a logic behind that, which is almost like the logic of quotas, that you have to make sure that the panel is, is properly well, represented. We're going to continue this conversation. I do want to bring in Aisha and also the idea of socialising uh, not just boys, uh, not just girls, but also boys, men mm. and women, about the role that women can play in society. But first, let's try to take another vote and see whether the needle has shifted in any direction since we began this conversation. So let's do a second round of voting. In the meantime, let's get back to Nelufar to see what's happening out there in the world. Nelufar. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I just want to remind people that they can get online dohadebates.com forward slash vote. That's where you need to head to right now whilst I update you on all the social media, including on Instagram, where I am hoping you are sending in your Instagram videos. Remember, it's really easy to be in the show, to be in the post show and tell me what you think. You've heard the voices of our speakers. I want to hear from you. Get onto Instagram, click on that uh, little paper aeroplane. You will have to search for us. We are Doha Debates. Once you find us, click the little blue button with a camera. Put the camera in front of you, record your message, tell me what you think. If you are as opinionated and have as much to say as some of the people on Twitter, I want to hear from you. Make sure you do that as quickly as you can. Now, let's take to Twitter, actually. I, I, I don't know where to begin. Uh, thoughts and opinions rage from outrage. Uh, actually, quite a lot of frustration about uh, uh, what is being said on stage. Our speakers have done very well to outline those three positions. Um, but we have people watching from all over the world, including in our shared studio portals, uh, where people are gathering in small watch parties. And I'm being told that generally people in the shared studios network are not on board with Christina's take. Uh, they think that her take might be a little problematic. 
Now, what does Twitter have to say? We've got lots of comments coming in, especially from late in September. As a man, I have to admit that even in the most unequal societies, men are still much better off than women, especially women of colour. Lots more to come your way in the post-show. Hopefully, stick around um, and tune in, and I'll read as many of your comments as I can. Rida, back to you. Thanks very much, Nilufar. Good to know that it is engendering quite quite a reaction online. Mm -hmm. Not to your surprise, I don't imagine, mm -hmm. Christina. Not to my used surprise. to being in university I, campuses, I, being I booed and threatened. It, it, I, I, I worry because, for example, this last comment that he thinks, in, in whatever the equality is, you know, the men are better off. Which men? You have to, you can't just say the men in American society. There's some very elite men that are, you know, extremely powerful and some very elite women. But the vast majority of men in the workplace, I mean, and, and then you look at what is their fate. There's a, a huge and growing cohort of men, young men, who are, are going to find no place in an information economy. They've fallen behind. They're not getting the proper education. They're not keeping up with their sisters. And there's very little attention to their problems because people are so carried away with the narrative of, fee of male privilege that they can't see the lack of privilege in, in so many little boys and young men. You look at the workplace. There are, uh, in the United States, I know that like 94% of the workplace fatalities are men. There are, uh, you know, 5,000 people approximately die in the workplace every year, die. And that's not counting serious injuries. And it's 94% men. And there's sort of a, you know, a workplace fatality gap. People don't talk about that. And in the United States, it's a complex multicultural society. And if you look at white privilege, well, the highest earners in America and the highest educated are Asians. So how does, how does that work into the analysis? So I'm saying, take a good look at the society, see who is suffering. It's not going to turn out to be a whole group. It's going to be part, and it's going to class will play a part of it, and race and ethnicity, but also not to lose sight of the fact that that we're all human beings. And it's and easy that's to generalize, to... and we shouldn't. But let's, let's now see if there has been any change. Let's look at the results of that second vote. But first, let's put up the results of the original vote, if we can, so we can compare and see if there has been any shift. So that was the earlier vote. And we see there's a little shift. Not a whole lot, but it's interesting to see that Aisha... Oh, we're evening out a little bit. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, your numbers have gone up a little bit, Christina. <laughs> so have yours, Randa. The ones that have gone back are Aisha's numbers. Quotas can have benefits, but we need to revise cultural expectations. Are you surprised, Aisha, that your message, what we've been discussing here, hasn't quite resonated? A few of the voters there have pulled away from you and have gone to the other two perspective. But I have to say, you're all within basically just one point of each other. So it's a very tight race, but what do you say, Aisha, yeah, I, I, I to those who haven't quite bought I don't your, think it's, your um, argument fully? Sorry, no, I don't think it's surprising because I think, you know, um, the panelists have really persuasive arguments and there isn't really that much difference between them. Um, so no, I don't think it surprises me too much. Um, and, you know, race, gender, and all these things are really hot topics at the moment that people have very strong opinions on, and I, I think Randa's uh, position is, is really strong. I, I c totally get it. So, no, I, I think it's, it's reasonable to me. And you're the youngest person on stage. Yes. You've also... She has age privilege. <laughs> the youth <laughs> revolution. <laughs> you've got your finger on the pulse. You've got yeah. a huge uh, megaphone, uh, social media. A lot of people follow you and listen to you and mm. want to hear your message. Mm. What do you gauge from the younger generation of people, both men and women, when it comes to gender issues? Um, I think what I gauge more often is that I think discussions like this tend to be contentious and get people's backs up because equality is a tricky word. And there are many instances where men do you know, suffer things that women don't go through. And what seems to be the conflict to me is the inability for both men and women to say, we suffer in different ways, you know, and they are relative to their experiences. And I don't think that means that we need to ignore women's issues or we need to ignore or downplay men's issues, but I think we need to take them both seriously. And the way that we go about 
this, there's this sort of line that's kind of like, well, we can't look at that until we've done this. I think we can do both. And I think if equality is our true goal, which it is for me, then I spend as much time thinking about women's issues as I think about men's issues. Um, and that's where I think about socialization. I think if men are told that the only way that they can be desirable, worthwhile, and all of these other things is by having power, which is something also women reinforce, um, of course then they're gonna flock to these positions more so. And so I think it's about allowing people to recognize there are so many different forms of power that are just as great and influential on the human condition. Um, and I don't think men know that enough, uh, which is why I think they flock to jobs that often don't even make them happy. Brenda, you get the, the last word. How do you see this discussion going forward? Obviously, the conversation around gender issues is often very sensitive. A lot of people are afraid to speak out, afraid mm. to be labeled, afraid to be put in a certain box. I think it's because we have to frame it not as um, you know, an enemy and a victim. I think we need to uh, look beyond that and realize that it is a partnership between men and women to address an inequality and imbalance in society. And addressing it doesn't just benefit women, it benefits men as well. And once people get past this as something, as an opposition between men and women, then I think that we can really start to see change. All right, thank you all very much indeed. Fabulous uh, conversation, a fascinating one. Randa, Aisha, Christina, thank you so much for being here. Let me also thank all those of you who've been watching us online, participating, voting, giving us your thoughts and ideas on this conversation. I do want to thank as well Northwestern University for hosting us here in Doha. And as always, the Qatar Foundation for making this happen. Do stay with us. We will have a post-show, an ongoing conversation that will follow with Nelufar and her guest, Monira Yassin. They will be analyzing what they've just heard until our next debate on the future of genetics from me, Rida Fakhri, and the entire Doha Debates team. Thanks very much for joining us. Don't go anywhere. Stay exactly where you are. Don't close the tab. Don't close the browser. We have so much analysis, so much show coming your way. Hi, hello, and welcome. I am Nalifa. This is The Post Show with our brand new set right here in Education City. I've got a lot coming your way. But before that, I want to introduce you to my special guest. It actually isn't uh, Manira. We've got someone equally as talented and, in my opinion, quite brilliant uh, waiting in the wings. And we've got some students as well who are going to be joining us. Professor uh, Firqa is waiting. Zarqa is right there waiting for us. And the students will, of course, be joining us in a sec. Now, as ever, I want to talk to you about getting involved. But before that, let's just take a look at that final result one more time. Can we put that result up? I want to see, I want to see what your final decision was during the show. Okay, so this was one of the earlier votes. 31.93% uh, said quotas do advance gender equality. Quotas can be beneficial. 4084, that's your winner. And very finally, quotas do not advance gender, uh, gender equality at 27%. So you guys have a lot of your minds still to be made up. This vote is not closed. You can change those numbers, and you can do that right now. Voting continues uh, if you go straight on to dohadebates.com forward slash vote, V-O-T-E. I will be able to change those numbers and get back to this before the end of the post show. Now, as you know, the coronavirus has affected significantly a lot of what we're able to do, but you guys have been watching online and engaging with us uh, via the global network of all of you watching. We've had people tune in <laughs> from all over the world. I'm so impressed. Thank you for sticking with us through this difficult time. We've had people tuning in from Brazil, Turkey, USA, Japan, Spain. Hello to all of you. Zimbabwe, Afghanistan. I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. I welcome you all and remember, you should stay in touch. I want to hear from you. You can always tweet us, you can always Facebook us, we are at Doha Debates, but now there's a brand new method. You can send me your videos. How would you like to be in the show? Literally in my show. I wanna see you, I wanna see what you have to say. Get onto Instagram right now, you still have time. Click on that little paper airplane, then you will be met with a search uh, screen. 
You just search for us, we are Doha Debates. Click on that, click on the little blue button and record yourself, film yourself. I myself feel very moved and touched by a lot of what people on that stage had to say. Um, I know I feel really powerfully and really strongly and I know you do. So I wanna hear from you, get in touch with me. Uh, now, the coronavirus has had a bit of an impact because we should have been joined by some students live in here, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to get them in here. So instead, I'm gonna go straight to my uh, guest who is sat right there, Professor. I'm so excited to be speaking to you. You are actually Professor Zarka Pervez. You are uh, at the university here, right in Qatar, HBK University. Wait. I'm sorry to misintroduce you. I think that's that was right. probably a former script. You and I have been sitting here mm -hmm. and talking, and I've seen you kind of clench and then relax, right. clench and then relax. For those of uh, our viewers who are still watching, whose comments and questions I will get to, what was your hot take? What did you think? How did you feel? Um, so, first of all, I really enjoyed the, the, the discussion. I think the speakers were excellent. I think they were the right people to speak about this topic. Um, I think they covered a lot of the very interesting points. Um, I especially enjoyed Rhonda and Aishat. Um, and Christina was excellent as well. Did you? Because you were disagreeing right. a lot. You I was, disagreed I a lot. I'm coming to that. Head. I am coming to that. <laughs> but um, I think probably um, uh, it, was very, it was a very academic discussion. So I think yeah. it was great to hear words like, intersectionality or like you know representation or I don't know elitism tokenism but an average person may not really understand what that means I don't know so, what intersectionality really means right I really don't and I just feel like when we talk in that kind of language a lot of the people watching are just like oh, why I don't know what's going on here this seems too much for me break it down for us why should I care about intersectionality and quotas right so I think intersectionality should be the new buzzword uh, in our lives I think intersectionality basically uh, means um, it has to do with our identity and so you know I'm someone who does a lot of work on identity so it basically shapes our sense of self so we all have multiple identities right yes. whether they're based on our race or religion or a color language and so they all intersect at different points and create our realities okay so, so you were you were a, a brilliant academic that you are you were taking Thank notes you. ferociously right. <laughs> what did you what did you really not agree with and what did you think stood out for you as a, because the point of this whole mm -hmm. thing for, for our viewers watching and commenting and I've got tweet after tweet after tweet which I will get into in a minute it seems to be that people want to continue this discussion want to implement change but we don't know what to do with quotas I mean an average person wouldn't know what to do so what mm -hmm. are you hoping to take away from the debate right so I'm going to answer the, this in two parts um, I think the first what, what I didn't dis agree with is um, this kind of romanticization of you know change will happen organically <laughs> you know we're just um, tired of waiting for change to happen organically I do believe in sort of like long term change, but I want to replace the word, word organic. I'm sorry, we do not have the privilege to wait for another hundred years or even more in the Middle East. I think it's going to be longer this is than this is, Can I just interrupt years. you there? Because this is what I find really interesting. On that debate stage, I heard them talking about intersectionality, race, age. I think Aisha at one person mentioned short women, which I'm not right. clear about, but no one <laughs> mentioned religion and right. no one mentioned Islam, no one mm -hmm. mentioned this region. Talk to me a little bit about your experiences um, and what you have studied and learned about what gender equity means here, what gender liberty means here. Right, so these are again two big things, <laughs> but if you wanted me to talk about my experience, I think being a Muslim um, in a Muslim country is different than being a Muslim in, an, in, in a different part of the world, in a, in a Western world. You know, I don't like to divide world in two camps, but we do live in a bit of a divided world. So I think um, uh, when we talk about equality, when we talk about you know feminism or these big words, they are um, obviously, um, to people, they mean it's a Western concept. Yes. And so there is a kind of a rejection of that. Yeah. You know, we have a long history of colonialism, you know, of being orientalized, of being the other, um, of, uh, you know, people coming here to teach us what we what we need to do and how yeah. we should do what we do. So I think, um, so I think uh, automatically when I, you know, when I travel outside or if, I, if I'm as a Muslim woman, I'm, I am the oppressed and that automatically there is a rejection of, you know. And people express this to you? Uh, they do express it sometimes. 
sometimes very obviously, sometimes in, a, in more subtle ways, sometimes you know, uh, indirectly, sometimes they're not aware of their own biases. But at the same time, being a Muslim in a Muslim country also sometimes implies that people would use a religion as an excuse to deny women their rights. And that is, you know, I don't like to victimize women. I don't think we're victims, but I think the patriarchy or the system sometimes whatever you uses want to call it. whatever you want to call it uses a religion um, as sometimes as a tool to kind of prevent women or to, to advance political agendas because you're a Muslim woman I'm a Muslim woman we don't look the same right we I know ideologically we don't feel the same and we don't agree on the same things right. but one thing we both experience is is womanhood is this idea mm -hmm. that 50% of the world's population doesn't get paid the same because right. we have different genitals. This, mm. to me, and to a lot of people online, is is kind of where the, the whole thing lies. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to get to you and the amazing organization that you set up right here in Qatar right. for women's rights and liberties. But first, I want to just read out some questions to you, well, some, some comments that mm -hmm. people have made that I think is really in interesting. Someone with a, and this is true, the handle is called Handle With Care <laughs> on Twitter, um, says, do we care more about power than equality. Mm -hmm. So do we live in a world where power trumps equality? A very interesting question. I could probably write a lot about that. <laughs> but um, Can uh, you say little? OK, so yeah, I'll try to sum it up. I think, um, so the way I understand is, I think um, a lot of the times equality is used uh, in, in, you know, as a tool to empower certain people. So yeah. it also has a sense of elitism to it. So it's very easy for, for me, you know, to, uh, you know, and I, 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 I know that I speak from a place of privilege, um, you know, to sit in a group of acad academia or to sit yeah. in with people who understand these words and say, you know what, gender equality is a great concept. We're going to have, we need to have quotas. We need to talk about equality. Yeah. But at the same time, there's people that don't even understand what yeah. you know, equality really means, yeah. right? So I think a lot of the times it's about tokenism. A lot of the people who talk about gender equality are really trying to promote their own positions and they're really trying to kind of, they speak from a place of power rather than a place of understanding. I'm going to end very quickly. I want to understand, because we're running out of time for this segment, right. I want to understand how you, in a very difficult environment where women's rights aren't very openly talked about, right here in Qatar, have managed to make a difference and set up an institution, set up an organization, and that there is hope, there are solutions, there are ways we can build change. Right. So I think there is a lot of hope. Um, I th what, uh, what you were talking about is, is a club that I set up at Georgetown University when I was a student in 2010. <laughs> um, it was called the Women's uh, Society and Development Club. And the reason why we set up this club and what we hoped to achieve was that we were just not, I was not satisfied with uh, what I was learning in the class. You know, I was an international politics major, but I was not satisfied with what was I was hearing. I wanted to, I, I needed answers to questions. I needed to engage with this society and step outside of hegemonic framework. So this club was basically set up to have a conversation with, yes. with, the, with the women in, in the wider society. So. And when people said to you very quickly, because I'm being told to hurry along, right. uh, the students are online and ready. We will hear from them right after this. But when you were told, this is enough, you have enough rights. Right. You disagreed. Right, I did. I disagreed to a lot of things. And I, and, but you agreed to coming on the show with right. me. Thank you, Professor. Couldn't say no to you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Very hard to say no to me. Stay right there, right. because I want to get to your tweets and comments that you have been sen sending in. I am so thankful to you for engaging. This is supposed to be a global conversation, and it cannot be that without it. So I'm just going to read a couple of the comments that you have been sending. And we've got one from David Quinn, who's actually a columnist for the Sunday Times um, out in Dublin, Ireland. And David says, um, the unexamined assumption in many of these debates is that men and women want exactly the same work-home mm -hmm. balance on average. Yeah. If they don't, it will unavoidably open up a gender pay gap. And closing it will require massive social engineering. So quotas, social engineering, should we do it, should we not? It's a really powerful question to ask. Mm -hmm. We've got another one from David here. Uh, there is some progress, uh, and David's in Zimbabwe, actually, but it's slow, he says. Uh, uh, Brandon from New York says, what does it mean that women get pulled out of mainstream society? That kept coming up in the debate, um, as we both saw. Christina mentioned mm -hmm. it quite a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes on to say, 
She seems to be existing in an idealized world that fails to account for the structure mm. of powers that limit the very potential she believes women have. You agree with that? Um, I do agree. Um, I will keep not you... fully though. Oh, okay. I do well, agree. we could talk off camera because right. I want to get to some really interesting mm. points. Uh, as I've been talking to you, your Instagram stories have been coming in, so we will get to those in a second. Before I go to my students, uh, I just. Oh, I'm being told the students are actually ready. So I will read you there, Professor. Govinda, hang tight. I'm coming to you. Thank you for running over. I saw you from the corner of my eye. We've got them. OK. Do you know how hard this has been, ladies and gentlemen? It's been tricky. But finally, we are joined right here by our three wonderful students. Uh, we've got Shamir, we've got Jaud, and Nadim. Say hi. Wave to the people. Hello. Can you guys unmute your microphone so we can hopefully hear you all yes. at the same time? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. okay. Shamir, let me come to you first really quickly. What did you think about that? Because you are basically the first man we've spoken to. So you represent mankind. How did you feel <laughs> the debate went? <laughs> yeah, no, no pressure at all. There. Um, so I think the the first that there were a lot of things in the debate. There, like I like the fact that there were a lot of conflict points, and that they sort of went around to resolve those a lot. Um, but the one thing I found in the debate was they mentioned a few points, which I just want to go over and just like really quickly in specific. So Rhonda mentioned um, the quota woman thing, like the label where if you put quotas in, people will just stigmatize uh, women and say, oh, she just got this job or she got where she is because of the quota. Right. And then she raised the question that why aren't men um, subjugated to the same level of scrutiny? Um, and I think that they are. And I think that um, even if they're not, that's what the system should focus on. Because ah. right now, as the status quo stands, men are significantly more privileged in terms of getting education and having qualifications. So, and Shamir, getting let me interrupt you the then. Let me interrupt you and let me ask you. You seem like you would gladly give away some of your power in exchange for equity and equality amongst the genders. What if people, some of your friends, aren't willing to give up power? Should we force them? I think that the fact is that what we should focus on is fairness, like ensuring fairness. Because then you, if you if we go down the quota road, then you'll have to start making quotas for stuff like race, sexual orientation, along with gender as well. Yes. And then there's no real way to stop the quotas there. Um, so if we focus more on fairness, like if we try to promote the system which That's only really has merit as the underlying factor, um, I think... I would be prepared to give up a lot of the privileges I got in terms of receiving education, in terms of being aware, in terms of me just like having this 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 notion that oh I'm a man I have to go then to school me, right. Let me but bring... if I had a sister, for example. Yes, that's an interesting point. Before I'm going to let you finish it, and then I'm going to bring Jaud in. If you had a sister. Yes, if I had a sister, then society in general would ask the question, right? Like, should she go to a, uh, like to school? Does she really have to? So I think focusing more on equality of opportunity is a better approach than using quotas in equality of outcome. Jod, what do you make of all of this? You are patiently sitting and watching the debate unfold. Do you think quotas are the solution? Do you think the vote, which is, by the way, still open, is the right answer, that we should have quotas, but maybe not all over the place? What do you think? So I actually do think that quotas are the answer, just because, um, like uh, the, the HPKU professor was saying, um, there is no way for organic change to come to life. And as of now, we do need um, dramatic change to get to where we want to be. And um, I think whether that's quotas of outcome or quotas at the beginning at, um, at the level of education, then we do need this kind of thing to not have to wait 100 years. Um, well, what, would you, Jan, what, what would you say? And yes, uh, uh, Dr. Zerka Parvez made some really insightful points. And I'm so glad to bring her in. But, but why do you, do you want to be a token? I mean, why would you want that? Would you want your sister to be a token? Do you want to be the token person in, in any university or profession? Um, I think that, uh, like, to go back to the point of scrutiny, I think that women are held to much higher standards of um, being looked at as tokens or being looked at as, oh, she wasn't good enough to get there herself. 
Um, that's not the case. There's a lot of privilege and the odds are stacked against women. So I don't think there's anything wrong with accepting a helping hand uh, to get to a better place than we are right now. Nadim, let's come to you. Are you, are you, at, are you at uni? Is that a lecture hall behind you? I am. <laughs> Thanks yeah, for taking yeah, a break to connect with me. I appreciate <laughs> it. I really do. Nadine, what do you make of this? Um, don't, I mean, don't mansplain to me, whatever you do, because we apparently hate that. I, uh, but I don't do... know if I can avoid that being the man that I am, but uh, I just want to add on to this point of frustration that I'm seeing, uh, especially from the professor and as Jude was speaking about as well. I understand the frustration that we can't just sit around and do nothing. But I don't think that that's what's happening. And I think what's more important is that we don't want to avoid making mistakes in our solutions that we're implementing. Because if we end up implementing this quota thing, and it turns out to explode on itself, uh, which maybe that's too extreme, but you see as the case with Rwanda, like Christina Hoff Summers was talking about, it just becomes a symbol. And what we're looking for are not symbols. We're looking for actual change. That's... So we don't want it to become something where it, it impedes progress where you're just fostering this hatred within colleagues and within organizations where you see these people and they talk about, you know, tokenization like you spoke about. And that, that will set things back in ways that we can't even see and we can't even understand. I love this. And, uh, I love this. Nadim, what you're basically advocating yeah. for um, and what I'm hearing you say is this, this whole premise of quotas is one interesting idea but we should be able to get mm -hmm. things wrong. So, Jared, what do you think? I mean, you, you are a staunch supporter of quotas. If we get them wrong, will we, as womankind, be, be held back and be held accountable? Um, I think there's a lot of pressure that's being put on getting quotas right. And as I see now, there's no other solution that works. So there's nothing wrong with trial and error, I think. Mm -hmm. and. Um, even though, like I talked about how organic change doesn't seem to be achievable, I think it's important that we work at it from both ways, both from the quota perspective and also trying to achieve societal change. Just because if we change the way that people see women and if we change it to a more positive view, then we wouldn't be facing the problem of tokenism and looking at women like they're not competent enough to get to positions of power on their own. Okay, the question I'm gonna ask all three of you and hoping that you can keep your answers slightly briefer is, do you think that quotas are the answer or are they not the answer? And, and, and tell me what you think in terms of applying it into the real world. We wanna know at Doha Debates, we talk about solutions, not problems. Is it a solution? Should we be f like, Step putting ourselves uh, feet to the fire and bringing this, offering this as a solution for gender, gender inequality, because we have about 100 years to wait for this to happen organically. What do you guys think? Let's start with you, Shamir. Um, so um, I believe the quotas are the, the, the answer to an extent, but it's very important as to how we go about it. So if you just say that, no, you have to stick a certain percentage of women in your company or in the office, I don't think that really works. I, I think that just creates animosity in the workplace. How it would work, however, is if on one hand, you have the system promoting fairness on the basis of merit, and on the other hand, you have government programs, you have just general societal awareness, and you have quotas, for example, or subsidies in schools and awareness programs for that, which empower women, which educate women, which give them the opportunity to make use of the fair system, which we will also simultaneously be promoting to get those opportunities fair, Thanks. like in a fair, just, equal manner. I love that. Nadim. Yeah, so I just want to start by quickly responding to something Jude said about organic and what that really means. If we want to make something, this process, as organic as possible, that doesn't mean sitting around and doing nothing. What we need is opportunities and to give opportunities. I think that I hate simple answers, and that's why I disagree with the fact that quotas are the answer, because we gave, you know, like the U.S. had the Equality uh, Pay Act and all those things, and you still find, you know, um, all these mismatches. That, uh, I'm not saying that was a simple answer, but at the same time, you can't just throw a number, you know, that you have to meet that's this very, threshold. That's very and all true. Of a you can't just throw a number. I appreciate that, Nadim. Uh, Joe, very finally, you get the last word. So I think that quotas and societal change will go hand in hand because it's both push and pull. So I would have to agree with what Shahmir said about um, 
creating opportunities in education and that kind of thing, because that is what will make quotas work, because the general um, perspective and how people see women will change. And the representation that uh, women will yes. get through quotas is going to help uh, societal change come to life. Jaud, Shamir, Nadim, three future politicians, excellent speakers. Thank you so much for joining me uh, at such short notice. I respect it. Stay safe out there. Make sure you have your hand sanitizer to hand. Thank you all for joining us in this post show. Now, we wanted to know what you guys think all around the world. So we sent a camera person out into the wider world to the streets of Reykjavik, Mexico City and Kigali to ask the question, how should governments improve gender equality? This is what they had to say. They should involve more women in their administrations. Women and men are equal, they have to have the same salary, there is no difference. To protect women in, in the maternity leaves or paternity leaves also for men. It's to include all kind of genders and all kind of types of society in their laws. By of course being themselves role models in gender equality they had to say, and it's time to hear for the last time what the vote count is for this, our debate on gender equality. The vote as it closes and as it stands will be up in a sec. But before that, I'm going to let you know that my connector, the guy you saw on stage, the only man on stage, will be joining me shortly. And this is the result of the final vote. Could, OK. The, I, Clearly wasn't expecting that, guys. Um, so we've got 32% of people agree that quotas are the solution. 27% think that they're part of the solution. 41%, actually, that number has grown and grown throughout the debate, um, says that no, quotas do not advance gender equality. There's only one person that I really want to speak to uh, about this, and he's standing over there. He is our connector. Dr. Govinda Clayton, thank you for waiting in the wings for me. Hot off the debate stage, how... <laughs> Again. Coronavirus. Anyway, never mind. Our <laughs> boss is going to have us. How was that? I mean, that, it felt really in, like intense watching those three fantastic speakers go at it. Yeah, I mean, that was fantastic. That was fierce, right? But there'd be a sort of really intense debate between all of the speakers. It was great to see the different positions really coming to life with the way they put it together. But the question that I think was on, on my mind when I saw you up there was you were really worried about mansplaining. Now, of course, I don't want you to mansplain, but surely if we live in a global world um, and 50% of the world's population are disadvantaged, it's going to take all of us, including men, to work together and find a solution. I thought that that was sort of lost in the message. Did, how did you feel? So uh, you've got a few points here, actually. So first of all, like I think... We had three fantastic speakers who all did an amazing job of presenting some really diverse different positions. So uh, you wouldn't want to change any of our speakers. But of course, actually, as came out repeatedly throughout the debate, if we're going to come to any solutions yeah. that, that fundamentally resolve inequality, then it's absolutely essential that men are also part of that discussion. Yeah, because you're supposed to be an ally, right? I mean, and you yeah. are. I, I, and we talk about this quite often, and I, and I know how you feel about it. In fact, I've actually got a, a comment here that I, that I thought you would want me to read out. Del Van Rienen in Cape Town, South Africa, says, I find it very problematic that a debate about quotas in relation to gender equality always comes back to men and where men stand. Gender equality is not the inherent minimization of men. Equality is not a give and take, but a sped spreading of equal access. I push on that a little bit and say, actually, a lot of men think that once... Well, not a lot of men, but a lot of people, society tells us that for me to have rights, you mustn't have rights. That's, the, that's generally the perceived notion. How do we go about breaking that? How do we solve that issue? Well, I mean, that is, in essence... That is the essence of conflict resolution, effectively, to have this kind of zero-sum game where we think, if you have something, then I necessarily can't have it. And really, when we think about any issue that we want to find some kind of consensus or common ground, it's about looking at the positive sum games. And we know that, from your explainer video right at the top of the show, that inequality is bad for everyone. We all do badly out of it. And so moving to a more just and equal society, we're both going to win. It's going to be a very much a positive sum game. Now, thank you, Dr Govinda Clayton. That is all from you, but stay where you are, because it is time to go to our Insta videos, all show, and up until right this minute, actually, I've been asking you to send in your thoughts on video on Instagram. Now it's time to see what you had to say. Hi, this is Nadine. I'm from Egypt. I'm watching the debate right now, and I think that the speakers make really strong arguments. 
Um, I think my initial reaction so far, based on what the speakers have said, is that I don't really necessarily think that there is one single approach uh, that can eliminate gender inequality. I think it is more of a blend of different approaches together that can really make us reach a realistic stage of gender equality. Um, I think quotas can serve as a strong temporary solution or as a catalyst to reaching a realistic stage, but I don't think that on their own they can serve um, as a sufficient tool. I don't think any one single approach can be a sufficient tool. It's more of a combination that, of different approaches that complement each other. Um, I'm really interested to hear what the speakers have to say about that. Which is right. Men aren't the opposition. The opposition are the structures that men have put in place to maintain dominance over women. That structure is patriarchy. I had never thought about it, but affirmative action is already in practice, but by default for men. It seems that a lot of organizations who hire people of color are expecting them to be representatives for an entire group, as opposed to contributing individual opinions as an individual person. Hello, hi, I am Aiden. I go to Northwestern and I just wanted to say I disagree with what Christine is saying. As much as quotas seem like, like an easy way out for us women, but it has really helped us, especially as a woman of color for me, for myself. Um, it's not like I can't get that job. It's more about reparation of the oppressions that my mothers and all of the generation went through. So I don't agree with what Christine is saying. And the thing is, you said that quotas don't work but you never gave us an alternative solution that we could go forward with. And the one thing that I didn't really agree with you is that you kept on mentioning United States, but you need to know there are women everywhere with different cultural uh, backgrounds, and you just need to have that in mind so that we can find a common ground and we can fight against patriarchy instead of fighting against each other. I couldn't have put it better myself. That's it from our post show. Just enough time for me to thank everybody, our students, Professor Z Zerka, who's sitting right there, thank you. And of course, Dr. Govinda Clayton, thank you for being here. There's just enough time for me to remind you that we're gonna do this all again, this whole thing. We're gonna do again in two days on the 11th of March where we will be debating Jean Therapy. In fact, the question we're going to be asking very clearly is the future of genetics. Should we create superhumans? It's going to be a big one. Join us then. It's actually really good. Awesome. Yeah.